The February event of the Blake Society celebrates the 40th anniversary of the cinematic release of the film Blade Runner, directed by Ridley Scott and adapted from the novel by Philip K. Dick, entitled, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? For many of us, the study of Blake is fascinating and detailed and an exegetic duty. We try to discover the provenance of his imagination and how he constructed his works and interpret the meaning of his many illuminated manuscripts and his other works. It's a difficult task, but there is another purpose and consequence of this work. And that is our understanding of Blake informs and illuminates how we go out and create things ourselves, how we imagine things. And one prime example of this is perhaps the film Blade Runner. It's almost a Blakean work almost a work that is part of the canon of William Blake's collected works. Although it has very few references to William Blake, it is almost a Blakean creation. And so in tonight's event, we're going to look at Blade Runner. And I hope all of us will contribute and join into this discussion that will be led by Andy Wilson and myself. Blade Runner is a science fiction film in some sense, a film noir in another. It's a detective story, a philosophical work. It's many things. It's also visually gorgeous. Ridley Scott began as a set designer and made many wonderful commercials where the production values were incredibly high. For those of you who are not familiar with Blade Runner, let's begin by sharing the opening sequence of this film. Welcome, Andy. Blade Runner has also many similarities to Blake's work. There are at least half a dozen versions 
of, of the film, the producer's cut, the director's cut, the final cut. And this is rather akin to Blake's work where you might find half a dozen slightly different variations of a particular illuminated book. Andy, should we give a description of the plot in case people are not that familiar with it? Sure, I mean, it's a pretty simple story. It's, uh, it's about a world in which um, Android production, the production of robots has become so advanced that they're now creating these very human-like um, robots, androids, actually called Andes in the, in the novel, shocking alarmingly enough. But, um, and the, these uh, work as slaves in the off-world colonies, colonizing other planets. They work in uh, combat teams, in building, uh, they provide pleasure services, quote unquote. Um, so they're, they're slaves, essentially. Um, and they have had built into them. They become so sophisticated that, as the designers say, they've begun to notice that they were developing feelings. And that's bad. So they've given them a limited lifespan of only four years. So that's what sets up the story. And the story is about how a group of these replicants have escaped back to Earth because they want to somehow undo this built-in lifespan and, and get more life. So they come back to Earth and they're trying to uh, hunt down, find, seek out their designer, um, uh, Tyrell of the Tyrell Corporation, who manufactured them uh, in order to get the secret of more life. Um, but their presence on Earth is illegal and there are special police units, Blade Runner units, whose job is to uh, kill any or retire any replicants found on Earth. So our story is really begins with one of these Blade Runners, uh, Rick Deckard, being set up to track down a group of replicants who've um, returned to Earth. And it unfolds from there. I think it's probably enough by way of the setup of the story. The film begins with an old fashioned piece of text which tells us, the viewers, essentially what Andy has said. And it adds a small detail that there was a rebellion, a violent rebellion in the off planet colonies. And because of this, all replicants were banned from the planet Earth. I think Blade Runner is an epic. And I suppose an epic means that it's a genre that contains all other genres. And that particularly applies to myths. And in some sense, Blade Runner is a myth that contains all other myths. Andy, would you like to talk a bit about the myths inherent in Blade Runner? Great, let's do that. So before I talk about the myths themselves, just a little bit more set up, which is to say that, you know, I first came across Blade Runner, um, really my first weeks of university, which was uh, many, many years ago, 1982, as Blade Runner had just been released, although I didn't know that then. And um, I, I studied philosophy. And in my first week at university, I started a, a two-term course on the mind-body problem uh, with a guy called John Haywood. And um, so I turned up for the first lecture on this course and, and the lecturer said, uh, you know, we're going to discuss this topic, which is a, the, the hard problem of consciousness. What is the relationship between the mind and the body? We're going to study this for two terms. Uh, but he said, but I can tell you now that if you want to really understand it, you could do just as well as just go and see this new film, Blade Runner, which has just been released. And uh, as it happened, uh, the film society was showing Blade Runner the next week. So I, so I went to see it, not, as I say, not long after it had been released. And I very much read it in terms of this thing about the mind-body problem, which is absolutely central to the story, of course, but my reading of it was very much dominated by that. Um, you know, so in my mind then, you know, one, or to put it another way, one way of thinking about the film is to see it as essentially as a struggle between man and machine. Um, 
in which we learn that the machines, which are supposedly inferior to humanity, are in fact, in the case of some of them, not least the hero uh, of the film, really, Roy Batty, the leader of the replicants, they're in many ways superior. And in fact, I mean, Roy is certainly superior to the Blade Runner hunting him down, Rick Deckard, who is a bit of a cliche. Um, it's part of the charm of the film is that Rick Deckard comes across like a Ray Chandler character. Uh, and he's also a bit flat and unemotional in many ways. Um, Roy, on the other hand, quotes poetry, most notably he quotes Blake at one point, but we'll talk about that later, and is a superb strategist, a leader, a fighter, uh, is intellectually brilliant, and so on. So, you know, the whole relationship between man and machine is, is, is already muddy because the machines are better in a way. And I suppose this makes you think about, you know, the, the, the relationship between mind and body. To whom do we give, um, do, to whom do we ascribe personhood and value? And this is, in some ways, it comes across today as a sort of um, technical problem. You know, can machines think? So people discuss that kind of question. And, and, and the film is really spiced up by a series of really heavy handed clues that Rick Deckard, the Blade Runner, is himself a replicant, which kind of queers the whole story about, um, you know, about it being a, a fight between man, man and machine, so to say. Uh, but nevertheless, that's, that's, that's one way to, to, to read the film. Um, and there are so many aspects to the film, you know, people who like the film. I, I, I fell in love with the film when I first saw it. And I've been in love with it ever since. Um, but the people who love it have, 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 uh, have uh, strong opinions about it and that they differ in the way they think about it. So hopefully we'll hear some of that discussion tonight. But one thing I want to say along the way is that while I saw Blade on a very much in terms of the question of uh, mind and matter, man and machine, man, excuse me, man and machine, more recently, I thought about it more, and I, I really saw a strong connection with Blake. And I wrote an article on my blog about the Blake and themes in Blade Runner. Um, and that's really been the sort of where I've been at in terms of the film uh, and, and, until recently. And then in preparing for this meeting, I had a sort of, I, I, I changed my mind about the whole thing all over again. I watched several versions of the film and I reread the, the original novel, Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I reread it and I really came to a startlingly different conclusion. One which, however, I think makes it much more of a Blake in film than I'd even assumed before. But more of that later. At this point, uh, I want to um, just talk about different mythological aspects of the film, because I think that it's a useful way to start thinking about the deeper structure of the film. Um, and I'll, I'll just run through some aspects of the story that correspond to myths that we, we probably all um, already know about. And in some ways, these myths, in some ways, they, they are competing with one another as explanations for the film, uh, but to some extent they contain one another like Russian dolls and are compatible with one another. So they, in a sense, just provide different um, uh, views into the film. So the first thing I'll, I'll talk about in that regard is that it's very much a story about, a, a, a film about death. The whole issue of the built-in limited lifespan of the replicants is vital to the whole story as they confront death. Um, and in fact, one important aspect of this is that, you know, it's treated as a special problem that the replicants have in the film, their limited lifespan, their, um, you know, the built-in um, death of, of the machine. But in the novel, it's, it's made very plain that this is a problem they share with humans. Uh, there's a character in the novel who's, uh, he's the equivalent of the Sebastian character in the film, and he's called Isidore. And his boss, Hannibal Sloat, is quoted as having uh, his, his favourite phrase. Uh, for, and he's quoted for no reason at all that I could gather, presumably just to get this idea across to you. His favourite expression is uh, mors certa uh, vita inserta, i.e. Uh, death is certain, uh, life is uncertain. The one sure thing, you know, is death and taxes, is, is really saying. So in other words, that humans have the same problem as uh, the replicants. 
um, they, they have to face death. And of course, this is the basis of the oldest myth we, we written myth we, we know of, the Epic of Gilgamesh, well, which is a book, incidentally, I first read um, when I was wrongly, um, I'm glad to tell you, I was diagnosed as having lung cancer. And I was thinking about, you know, the prospect of my own death. And um, I thought, you know, I really, you know, I'm, I've got to a certain age and I still don't really understand anything. I need, I need to really <laughs> go back to basics. And I thought, well, I'll just read literature, the oldest literature mankind ever produced to try and get some context on life. And I'd heard that the Epic of Gilgamesh was the oldest written story we know of. So I read it. And it turns out very much to be about, about death. Um, you know, Gilgamesh, the hero of the story, his friend Enkidu dies, and Gilgamesh tracks down Utnapishtu, who's a direct analogue of, of Noah in the Old Testament. He, he saves uh, mankind in, in the, from the flood, but he also possesses the secret of eternal life, and he gives it to Gilgamesh, uh, and everything's looking good at that point, but then Gilgamesh loses the secret. In fact, it's stolen from him by a snake. And therefore, he has to face his, his own mortality. And this is a really key part of the structuring of the story. So that's one aspect of myth, Gilgamesh, um, Enkidu and Utnapishtu. Um, another obvious candidate for, the for understanding the mythological foundations of the film is uh, Shelley's Frankenstein's monster, which presumably I don't need to explain to anybody, but, but essentially involves the story of a kind of a, a bastard creation, an illegitimate creation. You now, the moral of the story in some ways is don't play God, you know, don't try and compete with God in creation. Um, but when Frankenstein does that, it all goes horribly awry. And you can, you can see an analogue of that in the stories of the replicants who are created by the equivalent of Frankenstein, Tyrell. Um, and then we then have to face the terrible consequences of that and, and the suffering and, that ensues. Uh, another thing, a mythological aspect to think about is Oedipus, which I almost mentioned in passing. But in Oedipus, uh, in the, the, the original myth, Oedipus discovers that he's killed his father and slept with his mother. Um, and when he discovers what's happened, he, 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 he pokes out his own eyes with a, with a pin from his mother's dress as it happens. Um, Roy Batty, on the other hand, as the leader of the replicants, uh, knowingly kills his own father, Tyrell. When he confronts Tyrell and Tyrell can, can't give him the extra life that he wants, he kills him and he, and he pokes out his eyes in what I think is a, is a blatant reference to Oedipus. Uh, probably more important than Gilgamesh, or certainly more important than Gilgamesh or Frankenstein directly, is the figure of Milton Satan, as depicted, depicted on the right here by Blake, but Satan, as depicted by Milton, is uh, the bad boy of the story. He's Satan. He rebels against his god, as Roy Batty and the replicants rebel against their god and maker, Tyrell. Um, but as Blake and probably every poet who's ever read Milton noticed, <laughs> Mil M Milton makes, Blake uh, makes Satan sound like an outstandingly interesting, fine character in, in, in many ways, going against the grain of you know the official line about Satan, um, and there's many aspects of that Miltonic Satan to the depiction of Roy in particular in Blade Runner. So that's another framework for understanding him. Uh, I want to add my my big breakthrough, you know, in the last few years in understanding the film in relation to Blake, was thinking about Roy as Christ. Um, but also, in, in the, in similarly, as, as, as Blake's character of Orc, a figure of revolution, uh, a revolutionary character. Um, Rutger Hauer famously, when he's in the uh, Choose Eye Factory, him and Leon, another replicant, confront Chu because they're trying to uh, find a path to get to Tyrell, and they think that Chu, as a, as a supplier to Tyrell Industries, will be able to help them. So they confront him. But while they're in the factory, um, Roy casually quotes Blake. Uh, uh, he says, fiery, the angels fell. Uh, deep thunder rolled about their shores, uh, burning with the fires of orc. It's actually slightly a misquote, and some people read a lot into that. 
Uh, and I invite you all to comment on that, whether you think it's a deliberate misquote or to no consequence. Uh, but it's a definite, you know, uh, waving the Blake, Blake, Blake's flag out there to make that connection with Blake. What seems to me to be the connection with Blake's idea of orc as a revolutionary, but of an Orkian Christ, is that, and, 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 and the idea of Roy Batty as Christ is, is again flagged up uh, very heavily, uh, not least of all when he's about to die in the, during the final confrontation with Rick Deckard, he drives a nail through his hand, which is practically screaming at you that somebody wants you to think about Christ at this point. Um, so, you know, you're encouraged to think about Roy in some kind of context of Christ. But to me, what really brings all that home is that the type of Christ who's depicted as one who, at the end of this titanic struggle between Roy and the Blade Runner, Rick Deckard, in which Rick Deckard has killed all of Roy's comrades one by one, Roy and Deckard are finally confront one another on the roof of the, the Bradbury building. Uh, Roy's life expect expectancy is about to end. He's basically, as a machine, he's now winding down and facing his final moments. But in those final moments, just as he has the chance to kill uh, Deckard in revenge for all the replicants Deckard has killed, uh, Deckard is hanging off the edge of the building where he's fallen, he's clinging on to this, uh, this steel strut here. And he's about to drop to his death. And at the very last moment, Roy drops his hand down, the hand with the nail through it, I hasten to add, and lifts Deckard out and saves his life. At later, Deckard comments, May maybe in those last moments, he loved life more than he ever had before. Not just his life, anybody's life. And um, I think that's... Um, a reference to the, the kind of idea of Christ that Blake had. Oh, sorry, there's another hint towards the, the Christ-like nature of Roy, is when he dies, he, he, he drops his head and he releases the dove he's been holding, his spirit, and, and it's, it's uh, released to, to fly back to heaven and you see the dove ascend. And, uh, and this is very much in, the, the, in the, the, a mirror of how Christ is just depicted as dying on the cross by John. Uh, you know, it is finished, um, said, said Jesus. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Um, I'll skip through here and just say in terms of this orc and Roy as Christ, Roy as orc, Roy as Christ, the reason I see that connection as existing is because Blake's idea of Christ was, as, uh, was the Christian idea of the one who sacrifices themselves. Now, Roy doesn't sacrifice himself, but what he does in the last moment is what the philosopher Girard saw as at the essence of the Christian message is he breaks the cycle of violence, the violence between the Blade Runners uh, and, and the replicants, um, which is a you know, deadly and never ending violence. It's absolute. At the last moment, Roy recognizes the value of all life and reaches out to save Deckard's life, thus breaking the cycle of violence in a way that, as I say, um, you know, you, you can see as being the essence of, of, of in some ways, of, of, of the Christian message. Um, I won't say any more than that. I have a lot more to say about all these different aspects. I, I wanted, however, to just to, to depict those different dimensions of possible uh, ways into thinking about the core issues of the film and just throw them out there. And at this stage, just see what people think about that and what, what, what they have to perhaps to add to that or query about it. Um, uh, before we move on any further. So with that, Tim, I'll end my um, sharing and hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. The film is also on a very simple level, a love story between Deckard and Rachel. And Rachel is introduced to us at the Tyrell Corporation as the latest Nexus 6 a robot that doesn't know she is a robot. And so it becomes a love story between Deckard, a human, and Rachel, a replicant, where Deckard is charged with killing the person that 
he loves. So it can be viewed on many different levels from the philosophy and the mythology that Andy's just spoken about to a very simple love story. The film is also um, visually complex. So for example, in the opening sequence that we saw, it opens up with a view of Los Angeles and it's a sort of derivative image of the famous trope from Thomas Pynchon in The Crying of Lot 49, when he looks down upon Los Angeles and views it as a circuit board, um, a solid state device where all the diodes and triodes that form it become the map of Los Angeles. Also in that first opening sequence, the director Ridley Scott is playing with the eye. The eye is a common feature through this film. And rather like Blake made the distinction between seeing with the eye or seeing through the eye, what we see in that opening sequence is the world reflected in the cornea. So it's a third view. We see the world reflected through other people's eyes. So the film is wound up through many layers into a very complex device. And the fun in Blake and the fun in Blade Runner is seeing the possible interpretations, seeing the gaps in the cinematic work, which Rutger Hauer said is the, is the skill in acting in a film, the skill of the filmmaker. It's creating those gaps to allow the audience to interpolate and interpret the film. So let at this point open up to audience and if you have a question could you use the raise hand facility you should now all be able to do this So um, can I invite um, Jason Whitaker? Thank you, Tim, and thanks, Andy. And my apologies for not switching on my camera at the moment. It's been a long day and I'm lounging on the sofa watching Clips and Blade Runner. So um, I wanted to, to, to actually, before that there's so much to say about um, Ridley Scott and, and Blake especially, and I just wanted to draw attention to a couple of things before asking a very specific question. Um, Ridley Scott draws various parallels to a number of his movies. So Legend, for example, has recurring references to The Sick Rose, both, um, I can't remember the composer, that the, the theme music is um, an adaptation of The Sick Rose. And of course, Prometheus, which is a very flawed movie, um, has reference, visual references to Blake, Blake in figures in The Engineers. So Ridley Scott has this ongoing relationship with Blake throughout most of his career um, as a filmmaker. And interesting, a lot of it is visual. So I think actually, Andy, you're spot on with some of those visual correlations between Ork and Rutger Hauer, Roy Batty in the film. Um, the, the other, so forgive me, so another comment before going on to the question is that um, I, I remember, because I saw Blade Runner first and then went back to read Do Android's Dream of, Electric Sheep, and was so distraught actually, because because actually the the androids of Philip K. Dick's novel are very inhuman. I mean, the whole point is that they lack empathy. It's it's almost like a complete inversion of the film. What what Scott does is he inverts the fundamental message that the androids in Dick's novel lack something fundamentally human, and and for me. Um, uh, Ridley Scott's movie is far more interesting because it precisely blurs that boundary between human and non-human and that empathy. Uh, so, so I think there's, there's probably further discussion. That. The question I wanted to ask is, do you, uh, and so, forgive me, Andy, I'm, I'm directing this specifically at you, do you read Blade Runner as a 
retelling of a very specific work. And this has cropped up in a number of critics, and I think I've written about it in the past as well, which is that Blade Runner is, in, in some respects, a retelling of America, a prophecy. And that's why we get the quotation from America, but also it's set in Los Angeles, it's set in America, and ultimately it's about the return of slavery, which, of course, the rising of Orc, the revolution of Orc, was meant to um, reject. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely spot on in your observations there. I mean, I've always, my view until very recently has always been that the book is a terrible disappointment because the all of the, the first thing you notice is that all of the androids are pretty dismal, slightly dim characters, actually. They're not, they're not firing on all cylinders, so to say. Uh, whereas the whole dynamism of the film comes from the astonishing character of Roy Batty. I mean, the other replicants... To, to some extent, but but certainly Roy is the outstanding personality of the film, which is an odd thing to say about a robot. And that's why, um, uh, and that's how, again, that seems to me to be the main thing about the film in many ways. I think the structure of, you know, America is somewhat copied, but I think the main thing, when I reread the novel recently, what I noticed is that it's true that the replicants are kind of disappointing. But on the other hand, so are the humans, actually. One of the points that Dick makes a lot is that, for example, there's, a, there's another Blade Runner who's a sort of sort of the equivalent of the gaff character. And, um, and Deckard suspects that he's an android because he's so merciless in his attitude towards the replicants. So he thinks he's another replicant himself. But it turns out it's proven that he isn't. And this shows that humans can fail the voight kampf test, so to say. They can fail to show empathy. And that's very deliberate on, um, on, on, Dec on, uh, sorry, on Philip K. Dick's part, because he says that he got the idea of empathy when he was researching for the novel The Man in the High Castle. And he read the diary of an SS officer um, from the war. And at one point, this officer casually says, I was kept awake last night by the children screaming and crying from hunger. And he says, this shows that humans can fail to be human. And, and he says, and, and, and at the time the Vietnam War was being fought. In fact, the year that um, Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep was published is the year of the My Lai Massacre. And so what, you know, um, he's toying with is this idea that, that whereas uh, I suppose, Previously, I always thought it's a mistake to show the androids as lacking empathy because it makes it too easy to distinguish them from the humans. But it isn't easy because the humans often lack empathy as well. So it kind of puts them on the same in the same um, ballpark. And to me, that's the key. That's another key to the film. It is a political film because what the voight kampf test is, that test for detest detecting whether people are experiencing empathy, what that is about, it's a, it's a machine for detecting runaway slaves. Because if you think about the history of slavery and the struggle against it, I, I, think, I think of that image of a black man standing holding a placard saying, I am a man. Um, and in saying that, that, he isn't just saying, as a matter of fact, I'm a man. He's, he's saying, and everything that implies. I have an internal life. I suffer. I have pride. I have dignity. And so the first step in any struggle against slavery is to recognise the internal, the validity of the internal experience of the slaves. And I very much think that that's a key, it's a key message in the original book. Um, and it's, it's clearly all over the film. So it's very political in, in, in that sense and is about a slave uprising, actually. You know, I think, again, there's another layer on top of that, but I want to talk about that later. So I, um, but hopefully that answers your question, Jason. Can I, can I agree with Jason? I think, um, Ridley Scott has taken the novel to a far different level um, by conflating the difference between the two of them, that um, when, when they die, the replicants are full of blood. They're not the typical form of computer replicant that we think of as robots. And even in his play with the two actors, there are anecdotes that Harrison Ford had a terrible time with Ridley Scott, whereas Rutger, said it was the most wonderful collaboration. So he was trying to sort of diminish the human and raise up the replicant. So by bringing the two into a level that was almost indistinguishable, the film takes a, a position that is 
far different and far improved from the original book. Thank you very much, Jason. Can we move on to the next question, which is Stephen Pritchard? Hello. Um, yeah, I'm just fascinated to watch the film again. It was always one of my very favorites, Andy. And I, I'd always been aware that it's sort of got a very Gnostic sense of a flawed creator and the creation rebelling against that. And uh, it was very heightened, the sense of the uh, slave revolt in the off world. But in, in terms of breaking the cycle of violence, um, I saw for the first time how um, uh, Roy Batty actually grabs Tyrell's head. And as he presses his eyes out, he crushes his head and you hear the sound of the skull going and I suddenly thought of the grey monk with the hand of vengeance found the bed to where the deadly tyrant fled. The iron hand crushed the tyrant's head and became a tyrant in his stead. But as you highlighted, Batty passes that up and has the Christ-like qualities of compassion and forgiveness um, as, he, as he shows his its remaining superhuman powers and leaps across the gap and uh, and draws um, Descartes Descartes up, and he's referred to it's pronounced as Tyrell in the film, isn't it? And it's got the first three letters of tyrant, and I just thought that is that is extraordinary. And also the surveillance film, uh, it's surveillance theme in the film, and that's and the kind of eurozenic kind of eye. <laughs> That's the kind of thing Blake would do, call a character Tyrell for Tyrant, you know. So yes. that's, that's <laughs> Absolutely so. But uh, I'm really grateful to actually, to you, to reapproach this through that lens because uh, I've loved the film, but I've never thought about it so specifically in terms of uh, its, its Blakean, Blakean themes. It's very much about what it is to be human, isn't it? And whether that's to do with memory or whatever. Thank you, Stephen. For those of you who haven't seen the film, um, I, I haven't watched it for 20 years, and so this afternoon I thought I would. So I opened up my mobile phone, and in a couple of clicks, the film appeared with a cost of three pounds and 45 pence on my mobile phone. And in some sense, the technology of the film has caught up with us, as does all good science fiction. The next question, I think, was from I think it was. Can we, so, Tim, can we remind people that the chat is on if people just want to drop questions and comments there as well, if they don't want to speak? I mean, that's, that, mm. that would be good. It was Gary Stone, Tim. Yes, I, I thought Gary Stone. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes. Thank, thanks for everything so far. This is brilliant. Um, one one thing I, I've always thought is, the, is this fall, this Blakeian fall from the world of the imagination into the world of the senses. Their four year lifespan is, is, is their only experience, but in their heads, they have a full lifetime of experiences and imagination and things that they perceive they have been and done because it is put in there. So replicants are full from a, from a state of living in, imag in imagination to a realm of the senses when they come down to earth. Does that make sense? Does that make sense the way of thinking? I, I, I certainly think it makes a certain sense, but the, the problem only is that the memories that they've been given, the off-world the off memories, so to say, are fabrications and are on loan themselves. So they're highly hmm. to be suspected, like Rachel's memory of the spiders and so on. And, and that is um, partly deliberate, it's part of the, but it's partly the message of the film. It's also partly a very modern thing about the trustworthiness of all memory and, and, and all evidence and all stories that are told, including not just stories that are implanted into us if we're replicants, uh, but the stories we tell ourselves. I, there's a book about Blade Runner, which is actually a book about postmodernism, and it's the whole theory of postmodernism explained entirely through the story of Blade Runner. And of course, that's one of its key messages is that those memories are to be are negotiable, are to be queried, you know, they're not mm. certain. 
you know, that Roy's last speech, it's very Blakeian in the sense of you won't believe what I've seen. That sort of takes us back to the, the true fourfold view of the, of, of the year. It's almost like um, uh, Job with the, and the morning star sang together. It's sort of, it's, it's going back to that state, having fallen. That, that's how I always feel that. That's a flight of imagination, that, that final speech even though it could be an implanted memory. Food is ready, that's dinner time. I, I do think that's a key moment in the film, partly for that reason, partly just because it asserts the, the value and the worth of that experience, not just as you know, something I did, but it, it's meaning to the person who experienced it. It's, a, it's dear to him. And it asserts that above everything else, above all of the struggle and all of the conflict and all of the theory and, you know, can androids think, oh, do they have empathy? It asserts that, that this is a living being, a bit like the slave, you know, with his placard, I am a man. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks for that. When I was um, preparing for this meeting, I did a quick search of academic papers on Blade Runner. And the one which caught my eye was by a group of librarians who thought the key central issue of Blade Runner was memory of recording. So perhaps, Kerry, would you like to comment about memory and Blade Runner? Is Blade Runner a film that is important to you? Kerry Davis. Oh dear. Um, I came to this meeting really to challenge myself because to me, Blade Runner, which I've, I've watched twice recently, is a Hollywood film. And it's, I never watch Hollywood films. Um, I don't know what more to say about that. Um, I also read the book. Oh dear. It, it's as though Iris Murdoch wrote, wrote science fiction. I mean, there, there are moral questions there, but it's written so drably. Oh dear. And I, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> I understand what you're saying. I can appreciate some of the points you're making. And yet I say, this is a Hollywood film. It has all the compromises of a Hollywood film. Can, can I say that? Every, everybody Harry... smokes. That's, that's the one struck me on utterly bizarre. It's 2019 and people are smoking. What on earth is going on? And you read the book, which is 62, and they've got these electronic devices that enhance your mood, and yet they're still smoking. That's, uh, hmm, I know that's a trivial point in, in the larger scheme of things, but it, it's one of the things that worries me about this vision of the future. Well, it's, it's, it's the Hollywood nature of the film that gets so me, that, 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 that annoys me, that he's it, making compromises that his producer requires, that there's, there has to be a chase sequence. There has to be this absurd battle on the rooftops. These seem to me are compromises that, that his producer has required of him. And he doesn't really get away from that. I was also worried why with all the Chinatown, they have um, Japanese neon signs, but may maybe that was deliberate, I don't know. There are things that just worry me in that film, and I'm not going to watch it again. Philip, Philip it Kate, twice, that's enough. I think Jason wants to come in, but just to say, you'll be pleased to hear, Kerry, that, that Philip K. Dick thought it was a fascistic film. He calls it fascistic in his notes <laughs> and so says it was a terrible failure. I mean, I don't agree with him, but, but, but he <laughs> does agree with you. <laughs> I think he can see Hollywood films as having a quality within themselves. So Ridley Scott's brother, Tony Scott, famously produced Top Gun, which is yeah. a terrible film in some sense, but it does have an amazing quality of energy and action aimed at a very particular audience. 
which isn't which isn't me as an audience, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't go to see Hollywood films. I can't remember when last I saw a Hollywood film in, in a movie theatre. The last film I saw in a film theatre was National Film Theatre in November last year, Europa, uh, a film made in 1931 and recently rediscovered. And I think 1931 films could be art. They weren't this commercial entertainment product. I'll just come in actually. Blade Runner came out in the same year as ET and was a terrible failure. It was an oh. absolute flop. Um, mm-hmm. It was. It was. It's interesting considering you know that that actually the, the anticipation would be because it's a couple of years after the Empire Strikes Back. The assumption is going to be that people are going to lap it up because it's science fiction and because it was essentially a dystopian movie. It did not go down well at all. So it's kind of interesting that. Blade Runner in the, you know, Blade Runner shortly after the, the year it's set. I mean, it's still, it's like 2001, you sort of watch 2001 and go, what the hell, we're all meant to be flying around the moon now, and, and we're not. Um, so I get really annoyed by that. But actually, Blade, I think Blade Runner in the context of 19, the early 1980s was attempting to do something very different with science fiction movies, which in some respects was a throwback to the kind of the, the dystopias of the 70s, Alphaville and um, Westworld and things like that. So I'm a, I'm a massive fan of science fiction movies. So I love science fiction movies. And I think actually Blade Runner, what, what's the, I, I agree with Ridley Scott's comments, but it, it's, in some respects, it is a fascistic film. And it's principally that because of its aesthetic. And I think that's the thing I always find slightly worrying about Ridley Scott as a director. He slips into those Lenny Riefenstahl type um, optics very, very easily. Um, and, you know, it's no accident that his brother made Top Gun, I think. You know, sort of celebrating military power comes too easily to the, the Scott brothers. Black Hawk um, Down. Now, absolutely. God almighty, I've forgotten Black Hawk Down. Now, there's a, if, if you want me to agree with you about hating Hollywood movies, Kerry, I'll, I'll join you in the... No, it's, it's, it's just the entire, it's the entire structure of Hollywood movies. Yeah, yeah. They tell me, if I want a science fiction movie... Metropolis is, I, I could view Metropolis again yeah. and again. Um, what went wrong? The, the what, element I wanted to come in, in with, though, is, is to draw attention. And, and, and yes, Blade Runner borrows from Metropolis heavily. Yes, Particularly with right. its visual appearance. Um, and of course, actually, one, one of the accusations made against Metropolis was that Metropolis could actually be viewed as a proto fascistic oh, yeah. film. Um, you know, that, that, that Maria was actually, you know, a, a very distorted version, could end up being Adolf Hitler rising up to lead the, the, the Germans back to victory, etc. I mean, that's not at all uh, the intention of the movie, but it could, it could be a distorted interpretation. The, the point I wanted to come in, however, was just to reiterate this point. Um, Ridley Scott trained at art school, and that's one of the elements that contributed very much to a development of visuals. I mean, I mean actually... Uh, I mean, Ridley Scott as a filmmaker is one that frustrates me because I think occasionally he makes a brilliant movie such as Blade Runner. I, I think Blade Runner was an exceptional movie. And also the original Alien. I mean, the original Alien is, is essentially a, a haunted house in space. But working with H.R. Giger and sort of the visual design and that was utterly compelling, utterly astonishing. And something that uh, when, I, when I was doing some work on Scott, it was very clear that some of the analogues to Blade are operating very much at the visual level. That, that It's interesting, we talk about the philosophy of Blade Runner, we talk about it essentially as a kind of a verbally driven text. And what I was interested in some of the elements that you were bringing to the fore, Randy, were the visual components. You know, I mean, you, 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 certain stills, particularly, I think it comes more clearly when you see still photographs rather than watching the movie. Some of the stills of Roy Batty look like Orc. They, they are almost, I, I would be absolutely convinced. I mean, I've never asked, I did, I did approach him about six or seven years ago when I was doing some work and I, and I got some kind of those polite messages through the agents, etc. Oh, this is very interesting, but he's not gonna speak to you. So I've never been able to ask um, Ridley Scott himself, but, but it did strike me that he seemed to be deliberately invoking Orc as a visual icon. Um, for Batty throughout that movie. And, and I suspect that this is a lot that happens with Scott in his work. 
that his the analogs and the the parallels that he draws are operating on that kind of visual resemblance rather than necessarily the kind of philosophical and verbal parallels that we look for it, 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 one thing to draw attention to scott he's, he approaches movie making so sometimes i mean this this is very clear in a movie like prometheus where the plot is ridiculous i mean it's just pants it just doesn't work it's stupid and but what's happened is that that scott the artist i mean the visual artist has gone i really want this image to appear on screen and to that effect i'm going to actually ignore logic or the requirements of narrative um and sometimes that's kind of, that can be quite interesting if you look so i'm jumping onto another movie now so in prometheus the the very clear parallels between the engineers and some of you know the kind of blakey and beefcake that appears in in his various and particularly the illustrations to dante um I think I think Ridley Scott said he'd explicitly invoke Capaneus, the giant Capaneus from the, the Inferno. What you get is that the, the engineers don't make sense. They are not logical. But what Scott wanted to do was to invoke this visual recognition. And I think that's also partly what's going on with Org. So to get to the a, a long-winded statement, I'm thinking that the parallels that you notice, Andy, between Orc and Christ and Roy Batty, I think are definitely there, but I suspect they're operating on a slightly subconscious level rather than a fully verbalized one. But this isn't Ridley Scott doing what Blake does. The connection between the image and the text is not always there. And um, yeah. Ridley well, Scott is just doing that in the hour of filming. Yes. Well, I think the reason why I'm so feel this quite strong at the moment was some, some conversations I was having with Joe Biscomi, in which he got very heated about the fact that he feels too many Blake scholars read Blake first and foremost through the words and not enough through the images. You know, that Blake was, for someone like um, Job, Blake was first an artist who also wrote poetry. Whereas we, you know, that, that because of the, the tradition of studying Blake through essentially English literature departments, there's a tendency to read Blake as a poet who also painted pictures. Um, so I think, I, I wouldn't be surprised if sometimes Ridley Scott's approach to filmmaking is visuals first and make the plot work after. And that sometimes, I mean, and this, this, this is Joe Viscomis, you know, if you look at the large color prints, for example, we interpret those, you know, there's been a tendency to interpret those through Blake's prophetic works. And Scott's, um, sorry, and Joe is saying, no, it's through, it's Milton, it, uh, sorry, not Milton, it's um, uh, Michelangelo uh, and, and, you know, artists who are the primary influences on Blake rather than verbal sources other than Shakespeare, obviously. Thank you, Jason. Can we bring in William Honer? Hi, um, Bill Honer. I'm a professor of psychiatry just to provide some context. A friend of mine is named Stephen Minger, who um, was actually quoted in The Guardian some years ago as saying the Blade Runner was the best science fiction movie ever, and it was about what it means to be human. I, I, the really wonderful um, opportunity to, to learn about thoughts and so on on this. And I wonder in part, if we learn about those of us who are interested in both Blake and Blade Runner, what, what that says about us. But anyway, a, a couple of thoughts I had, you know, Steve, um, Philip K. Dick was apparently quite a heavy amphetamine user and thinking about the visionary experience, whether some of his, his sort of work and, and things come um, from that and thinking about Blake's capacity to, to, to experience visions and so on, just I thought was, was interesting. Um, another thing that, that struck me, and going back to some of the earlier discussion about memory and so on, is the, you know, again, my learning about Blake, the importance of innocence and experience and thinking about childhood and as a, a very different kind of state and a different way of experiencing the world and so on. And then, um, and obviously he, he incorporated some of his experiences and memories of being a child in his own, his own work. And what's important for the replicants is to have these memories of childhood. They obviously did not have a childhood because they're only, their life experiences six years as fully formed kind of quasi adults, but just that, the memories of childhood were part of what made them human-like and so on. So I just thought those were interesting kind of things and um, that it, it draws some parallels between, well, the first off, Philip K. Dick and 
and Blake in terms of the visionary capacities they had, and then perhaps the scriptwriter for for Blade Runner the movie, and and this importance of of the memories of childhood. And I wonder if any if Tim or or Andy had comments about that or or any others. Andy, you go for it. Well, I, was, I wondered if there were more questions. First, I saw someone else had their hand up, but we could take another question and then come back to them together. I, and I also want to make another point in response to Jason later about this, this thing about the disjunction between images and, and text in Blake and how that works in Blade Runner, maybe. I, I love that point. It, it is deeply perplexing that, that um, I like Blake, Blake Runner and I like Blake and I like Top Gun and I like Blake. And um, what, what is going on in, in, in that um, process in, in my soul? Um, Valerie. Hi. Um, I, I would like to follow in um, what the last person commented on and which is very much my, my, my vision. And um, I'd, I'd like to propose a, a different slightly. I, I, I mean, I missed the beginning, but I hopefully, you know, haven't missed um, what I'm about to say and if it has been already mentioned. And I, I really believe that whether it's Blake or whether it's um, Philip K. Dick or many of the vision, visionary people who actually want to present an idea of, for me, it's about how it is to be human and to move towards what it is to be a humanity. And I mean by that a sense of moving from the selfish gene to what it is to be completely interdependent and interrelated from a cellular level whereby we no longer exist as, you know, this ego-based sort of entity, but something, something which is far more, far beyond that level of consciousness, which is often on the level of what often is seen as visions and the inexplicable, you know, the psychotic episode, all these things are so many people have, you know, like Adler, Young, I've, I've explored, or I'm reading at the moment, the, you know, Franco, and he describes that episode where imagination is so powerful and the thing that really is the glue is that ability to go beyond that field of consciousness and you know, this energy, the, the matrix of this energy field, which is really what all these films for me are about, is pointing out with a, literally a gun in our head that we have to understand at a deeper level who we are and how we can move forward from a humanitarian perspective. So I'm just wondering whether there's something I that... Hmm. I'd love, I'd love to answer that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to say first that um, the the thing that Jason said is very important. I mean, in Blake, it's important, mm -hmm. the thing mm -hmm. about the disjunction between the image and the text sometimes. Mm -hmm. But in Blade Runner, that's, that's, that's true many times over because you have different versions of the film, different mm -hmm. emphases. You have the novel. And I do think you have to take them all together and mm -hmm. consider them, uh, but that gives them a certain richness. There's so many mm -hmm. contradictions as there mm -hmm. are in Blake. I think you've hit on what to me is the main thing in the film because Blake talks about, you know, his, his vision, but he talks about different levels of vision. The sort of the sort of basement level of, 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 of vision is single vision and Newton's sleep, which roughly corresponds to how we see the mechanics of vision. You know, and it but it corresponds also, Blake says, to a situation in which you perceive uh, disunity and everything is separate. And mm -hmm. I find it very striking that in that way of seeing vision, 
you you have a Cartesian view of there's only one soul there, which is you, and mm. everything else is just information and light coming in in your vision. Mm. And that, that light is even described in terms of Cartesian points. I think that's like the lowest end of vision. At the mm. other extreme, Blake's full fourfold vision, I think he says, he, I, you, we perceive in unity, the unity of all things, uh, and not the isolated ego. And I think this is a key part of Blake. But I want mm. to say it's also a key part of Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Because, mm. And one of the things I think mm. I certainly missed about the film, completely mm. missed it until I watched it again recently and, re and read the novel, is is that I've always seen it in the way it was set up for me by my lecture. It's about the mind-body problem, can a machine think? Actually, in the book, there's, there's a lot, a, a lot of the book, is, uh, and this is similar to Blake, that you, you're, there's, there's so much of it going on that you don't even notice it. Mm. It's about animals. Animals are all mm. over the book, real animals, yeah, yeah. Uh, artificial animals. The, mm. the official religion is mercerism, in which it's illegal not to empathise with animals. And Blake is very much like this. In his imagery, the spiders and snakes crawling all over the place. You know, the, you get these animals everywhere. And, it, and I was really stunned recently when I, I went away and I read Philip K. Dick's philosophical notes, uh, his exegesis, <laughs> And I'll try and I'll try. I'll actually, I've got a slide here. I won't. No, I won't, maybe I'll show the slide. Uh, if you give me a moment, um, there it is. Uh, Philip K. Dick and his his co the collection of his amphetamine fueled philosophical ramblings. <laughs> his huge mm. book, The Exegesis of Philip K. Dick. He 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 talks about one of his central themes is what he calls the third charisma, which we shouldn't get hung up on. It basically means a revelation, a proclamation of the Christian mm. gospel. And he says central to it, in fact, I'll take you to the quote. He says central to it is the beetle I was tormenting when I was in eighth grade, I saw it as holy as Christ. Later, the turtle was the crippled lamb who lagged behind. It's all in do androids dream of electric sheep. Mm. Uh, seeing the Christ humiliated and die. He goes on in this vein and he says, why am I so joyful? I celebrate victory. I've done my job and I know it. What was that job? The job was to spread the third dispensation in print. And I did so in Do Android's Dream of an Electric Sheep. And I need to do nothing else. And this third dispensation is before it was where man, the man is, there is Christ. Now it is where the animal is, there is Christ. Um, viewed in terms of God's strategy, uh, Blade Runner has been used as a means to an end to bring the kerygma in androids to the public. The kerygma of the revelation that animals are alive and they have an internal experience. And what I, you know, in reading this, what I realized that I've always, is that I've always seen the story of Blade Runner through the filter that, that Ridley Scott sets up of the, the conflict between man and the, and the android, in which we eventually realise that the android is, is, is as worthy of praise and recognition and status as the human. But actually the story itself, and there are only, you know, it's, it's commensurate with what happens in Blade Runner, but it's much more obvious in the novel. The story in itself is about all life. And I think this is a central part of Blake's vision is that when Blake says, you know, everything that lives is holy, he means everything. And at the far end of his vision isn't just a vision of the unity of all mankind, but the unity of the created world and of animals. And the reason I, 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 was, I, I sort of was a shock to, to find that is that I've been thinking about that anyway recently, thinking about Blake's relevance to the ecological crisis and to nature. And I think, you know, once you understand that Blake's vision involves recognising that, that all life is holy and empathising with it, you've entered a different mindset completely, which has huge political ramifications over and beyond the sort of first order ramifications of seeing that the, 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 that the androids are slaves, like black people in, in America, for example. You've now got this much more expanded Blakean vision of that everything is holy and that that's not your nose isn't rubbed in that in the film uh, but it is there and it forms the the struck the I think that forms the overall structure of the film over and above the story about man versus machine
And in fact, you could go even further and say it's almost a pantheistic film. And in the novel, Descartes says regarding the animal replicants, not the real, not the real animals of which there are many more in the book than there are in the film. He says the electric things have their lives too, too paltry as those lives are. And I think there's a whole world of Blakeism in, involved in that view of, of, of things. So stop and sharing. Sorry about that. Just to follow up on Valerie's point and Bill Homer's point, it is a trope sometimes in science fiction where you try to dissolve the distinctions between things. So in Blade Runner, the distinction between the replicant and the human is dissolved. And also, if you take Ursula Le Guin's most famous book, The Left Hand of Darkness, the fundamental distinction in our culture between the sexes, male and female, just gets dissolved because on the planet she visits, the people turn from one to another randomly and there is no distinction that we hold so dear between male and female. And so Blade Runner is following in that tradition of undermining that fundamental distinction that we try to impose in a dualistic philosophy of the world. Kerry, you have your hand raised. Um, yeah, just a couple of points. Um, we're talking as though this film is Ridley Scott's film. To what extent is it his film? Because my reading suggests that practically all the words that Roy Batty says were devised by Rutger Hauer. Rutger Hauer wrote his own script, I, I believe. He, certainly Rutger Hauer, I believe, put in the, the Blake quotation. And I think Rutger Hauer also wrote the, the closing words uh, of, of, of his character. So to what extent is it Rid uh, Ridley Scott's film? Um, Douglas Trumbull did the special effects and so on. Um, you know, Jean-Michel Jarre did the music, which, which is very effective. Um, that's part of being a Hollywood film, but the, you're trying to take, it seems to me you're taking this sort of, is Ridley Scott really an auteur? I don't think so. I think he's, I don't know, I don't know what to call him, but it's, oh, and yeah, okay, leave that for a moment. Is Ridley Scott really the maker of this film? That's one question. The other was point of information. Please, uh, Jason, you talk to Joe Viscomi, and Viscomi tells off literary scholars for concentrating on Blake the poet, not seeing that he's really an artist who happens to write poetry. I have to point out that David Warrow and myself made precisely that point in, in 2012 in re-envisioning Blake. So I, I'd like a bit of credit. For absolutely, that. absolutely, no, no. I, it was purely the conversation I had with Joe over the summer. So that, that was fresh, okay. that was fresh in my mind than, than the paper from twenty twelve. Yeah. Uh, was there any other point I wanted to make? I think your point. Oh yeah, Harry, just but... think, thinking of uh, sorry. Just, just the third thing is you're talking about Ursula Gwynn merging the sexes, um, Philip K. Dick merging human and the machine. You can also add Codwain of Smith, who merges human and animal. You have human animal cat blends, you know, cat people in some of Codwain of Smith's science fiction. I don't know. He's one of the few science fiction authors I've, I've read with a certain amount of pleasure. But I just float that idea. So it, it's, yeah, that's all. I, I think I've said all I need to say. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kerry. <laughs> I think your point, Kerry, that Rutger Hauer essentially um, wrote the film. I, it's well, a wonderful one more point. point. I want to see it, it's Hauer's a wonderful film. point, yeah. Kerry, that what you're saying yeah. is that this is the first film made by a replicant. So thank you, Kerry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'd like to see um, 
the Rutger Hauer version, you know, Harrison Ford is so boring. Oh, God, let's have more Rutger. There must be more material. Oh, it was, it was Harrison, much Ford, film. Harrison Ford was cast, presumably, by, uh, by Ridley Scott. And I took the very first thing he says in the film in the, the, with, with the voiceover version, so the, the, the original theatrical release, he says, that cold fish, that's what my wife called me. So basically his boringness and the fact that he's a cliche anyway from a Ray Chandler novel is screaming at you that he's a replicant. So, so his dullness is kind of constitutive, you know. Jason, did you want to come back? Yeah, um, mum's, um, it was actually following on from Andy's comments about the, the exegesis of Philip K. Dick. I did far too cursory work, so I'm kind of throwing this out to other people. Um, but actually, before I come to that point, I, I think I think uh, Kerry's comment about the, you know, is this really Ridley Scott's film? And is he a note? I don't think, to answer that question quite directly, I don't think Ridley Scott really is an auteur because he started out making adverts and his commercial, his ultimate commercial filmmaker. One of the things that's really interesting, it goes back to what Andy said earlier that you know Rutger House said he had it was a great it was a great project. I do actually think that if you think about when you read about a lot of auteurs and and the, the process, that actors you very often hate it because the director is imposing their rather Eurozenic vision, and and that is best. And and th I've always had a soft spot for Ridley Scott from the work that he did with H.R. Giger on Alien, in which it kind of just went to Giger, okay, you take over, you know, you. When Giga said, oh, I can do the sets as well, Ridley Scott went, great, you know, fantastic. So I think at his best, there's always been an openness, which comes partly out of that kind of commercial give and take, where it's not the director imposing the vision. It is collaborative. It's working with other actors. It's working with designers, etc. cetera. But, but the point I wanted to, to end, because forgive me, I'll have to go in a little while, is that I didn't do the work to find out how much, if at all, and I, and I do emphasise the if, and um, Philip K. Dick is at all influenced by Blake. And I'd be interested, Andy, if you encountered anything. However, the one comment I'd make, yeah, I, I couldn't find anything. And, and I didn't want, you know, I'm always wary of that kind of, oh, I like this author, therefore they must be influenced by Blake, etc. That That's just rubbish. Um, however, he was friends with Theodore Ray Nelson, who wrote, I mean, Kerry, if you want a terrible novel, Blake's Progress, you can, you can find secondhand copies um, it was 1975, 76, and it's basically about Blake as a time traveller, and, and uh, sorry, the, the, the four Zoas are all time travellers, and they, they re and Blake's and Catherine kind of hunt them down through time. It's so bad, it's kind of compelling. It's truly awful Pulp Fiction type stuff. But, but Nelson was friends with Philip K. Dick, and they, they basically took lots of drugs together in the 60s. And it wouldn't have surprised me that, that Nelson and Dick would have discussed Blake, because Nelson is, I mean, interestingly, Nelson does seem to know quite a lot of stuff about Blake, which I suspect came from the reprint of Mona Wilson's biography of Blake um, in 72 or whenever it was. So, so Nelson is clearly very explicitly influenced by Blake, but I've never been able to find the explicit connection myself in, in Dick's work. And I was just wondering if you had Andy. I've never seen anything explicit. No. One, thing, one thing I would say though, in response to, um, you know, K Kerry talking about Dick as a writer and stuff is that I, I, my view for many years was that, why would I read Philip K. Dick if there's still things by William Burroughs that I haven't read, for example, you know, I, I just wouldn't go there. But I think some of his, his very, his last trilogy of, of novels, particularly his novel Varlis, although I, I don't see any, you know, connection with Blake or any influence there, it's, it's, on a, it's on a par with Blake in terms of its mind-blowing cosmology and it's just, it's got a, it's a kind of weirdness level that goes far beyond anything else Dick wrote. And I think he was in the middle of some kind of you know, full-blown psychosis, but it's really, really fascinating. Uh, and I won't go, uh, you know, I won't go into the details of it, but but it's a, on, a, on a different level to uh, almost anything else he wrote, uh, Varlis. Um, and also of note, uh, the, the two novels around the same time, I think The Transmigration of Timothy Archer yeah, and The Tim Three Stick Yeah, they're, they're, these are great books. Um, and um, I, but again, I, I think that the, the question of, see, I was listening to Kerry talk about 
about about Ridley Scott, and I was kind of nodding along because I don't, I can't work up the enthusiasm to disagree. Because I think you're right. Really, it's a bit. He's not. He's not. So, he's not a great filmmaker and author, if you know what I mean. But I think Blade Runner turns out to be very much an ensemble production. It's got. It's very much full of contradictions. It's full of overlaps. It's for people pulling in different directions. It has a strong contribution from from Rutger Hauer, as you say. Um, you've got the whole underpinning of the, the Philip K. Dick universe. And I think it's a bit like a rock group. You know, it's a lot of my favourite rock groups. You, you you interview the members of the, the group, and they're all idiots. But somehow, when they get together, they manage to do something outstanding. And I and I sort of judge Blade Runner at that level. I think some of the aesthetic is kind of cliched Hollywood da 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 but the film just uh, triumphs despite all of that because of the, the payload that it carries um, and also the shock of the new at that time it really was one of the first films to show that kind of cyberpunk uh, low life high tech kind of world uh, the dystopia as, as Jason said earlier it just uh, actually as Jason also said it bombed in the cinemas but it's but it's built up such an enthusiastic following because of the many many strengths that are there possibly despite you know uh, despite the producer <laughs> possibly if um, Bill Hona is still with us I, I wonder from your perspective why do you yeah. think Blade Runner is such a successful film that why does it get into people's um, hearts so much and so often? Oh, that's tough to say. I mean, I, I, I think it, I, I guess, thinking about what others have said and so on, it, we all question where we came from. You know, this is a line from the film, I guess, which I can't repeat <laughs> verbatim, but you know, the same as everybody else, where we where we came from, where we're going, how much time we've got, and it it it, it connects to me something fundamentally human about what is you know what what our life, what our inner lives are about, and those kind of things, and and the the visual beauty of it too, and you know even as as well the follow up twenty forty nine to the the visual aspects of it, having that visual and the 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 text things that Blake brought together too, to me are are really interesting. Um, yeah, I think that that's that's it. A, a final thought, and I, I don't I don't quite I don't know if anyone else understands it, but the the way that Blake created the illuminated books, um, as I understand it, there was something about his printing process that was unique and so on. So it just makes me think of technology, you know, and and whether there's something about technology that that he was doing too that that is again, another thread of connection to the, the film and, and the technologies and so on too. So, so yeah, that's, okay. I don't know, but I hope that helps Tim. I'm, I'm not too, too deep on this, I'm afraid. Blake famously said that execution is the chariot of genius and Blade Runner adopted some technologies that you know, were right at the edge of what was available. And, and sometimes some very simple tricks to achieve what they were trying to do. Um, many of the light sequences were apparently putting broken mirrors at the bottom of a bowl of water and letting the light come off it. And you get those strange lighting effects um, in, in the background to some of the scenes. So it was very innovative and the model making was extraordinary for its period. Friends, we're, we're coming to the end of the evening. So I'd like to thank Andy for um, being the rock on which this event rested. And for all of you for taking part and contributing to this discussion about Blade Runner. So thank you very much for attending and I hope you're all clear in your mind whether you are a replicant or a human and we see you at our next event, which will be in the month of March. So good night, everyone, and thank you for joining. Thank you.